been a slow go in Virginia to get more and more people able to vote or to get those who are able to vote to actually go out and do it. Um, they've had to fight against people who didn't want change. Voting is a very, very important right, but it's also a right that people have to fight for. A lot of people before us have paved the way and given us the opportunity to come out and vote, so why not do what you're supposed to do? And it does make a difference. Every vote counts. You know, election day uh, and voting is the one time where everybody in the country is equal. You know, that's the one day uh, where everybody that's eligible to vote is, is able to participate in that process uh, and everybody gets one vote. Uh, and so we want people to be comfortable in expressing themselves uh, through the ballot box. Our social contract is based on political participation. Voting is your freedom. People generally tend to think of American democracy as like instant coffee, like you just add water and poof, there it was. It took a long time for America to become the inclusive republic that it is. Um, and I think the more people know about that struggle, the less prone we are to um, falling into some of the pitfalls that our forebearers have fallen into. If you go back and you look at the past and you see the way that people struggled and how they struggled and what America was and how we restricted certain people from being involved in certain things, it's nothing short of remarkable who we are now. But you can never respect how we got to now if you're unwilling to interrogate the past. It's one of the great ironies of Virginia history that Virginians like George Mason with the Declaration of Rights, Thomas Jefferson with the Declaration of Independence, uttered some of the most profoundly influential and eloquent language about freedom and democracy. But at the same time, they didn't intend all men, and all men are created equal, to mean all people. They didn't even intend it to mean all men. It was all property-owning adult white men. The linking of the suffrage with land ownership is actually something that the earliest settlers brought over with them from England. If you owned part of the country, literally, then you could be empowered to help govern. Nobody else was allowed. That maintained from 1660 to 1851. The Declaration of Independence was an eloquent statement of rights, but it was also a very powerful piece of political propaganda. Jefferson was writing for and about the political nation. He was trying to persuade other American men to join him in what was a collective act of mass treason against their king. They were all equal to each other politically, but this was the political nation, this was the voters. Didn't mean slaves, didn't mean Indians, didn't mean women, but the language and the ideas of liberty and equality are so powerful that people began almost immediately trying to make that implied promise into a reality. Uh, those words and that language fueled the anti-slavery movement of the 19th century. They were at the heart of African-American demands for suffrage uh, after uh, emancipation. They were at the heart of the woman suffrage movement in the early part of the 20th century. They were at the heart of the civil rights movement and the woman's movement at the end of the century. That is really powerful language. Since Jefferson penned his stirring words more than two centuries ago, Virginia's electorate has expanded and become more representative of its people, though not without struggle. Much like the voting ranks have changed over time, so has the process. We tend to think that uh, the way we conduct our public business has always been the same. Uh, one thing that has definitely changed a lot is how we conduct elections. Until 1864, all elections in Virginia were by voice vote. You went to the county courthouse or to the voting place. The candidates were there, everybody else was there. Half the county was there and most of them were probably drunk. It was more like a carnival than a solemn public event. And everybody by law had to vote out loud. You stood up and you said who you voted for and everybody knew. So it was more like a festivity than we think of an election as being. Henrico voters would have enjoyed the voting festivities at several sites around the county. An 1856 newspaper lists eight voting precincts, including the county courthouse and Walkerton Tavern. Once Walkerton passed out of its official use as a public building, 
it still continued to serve the community um, in slightly smaller ways. Uh, first at the voting precinct in 1853, and then three more times when it was definitely someone's private family home. However, we don't believe that any of those elections were anything on the federal scale for presidential elections. They were probably more for local Henrico County official elections, perhaps a few state elections uh, incorporated into those as well. In 1864, new state constitution required for the first time that voting be done by ballot. These ballots were not secret though because candidates and parties printed ballots on different sizes and shapes and colors of paper. So you could see who everybody voted for. That was not a secret. Some voter election officials required that you hand the ballot to the election official and he would then put it in the ballot box. Election officials sometimes palmed your ballot and put in one of their own. Election officials might sometimes accidentally put six or eight or ten other ballots in with yours at the same time. So it did happen fairly often that when they opened the ballot box there were more ballots in it than there had been voters. Uh, there were a lot of ways to cheat. Even when they put in uh, what we call the modern Australian ballot in 1894, the secret ballot, the state printed a ballot and put every, all the candidates' names on it. And you had to go through and you had to draw a line three quarters of the way through the name of every candidate you wanted to vote against. Well, that's a literacy test by another name. Voting was, was a very much a, a spectacle. It was a public event up until that time. Then it became an event that you did privately in a little booth. People came and went all day long. Following its defeat in the Civil War, Virginia extended the right to vote to former slaves and other African-American men for the first time. This dramatic expansion of the franchise, mandated by federal reconstruction policy and enshrined in the 15th Amendment, would prove to be short-lived. The Civil War destroyed old Virginia in many respects. Destroyed slavery, destroyed the hold that the planter class had held on politics since the very beginning. And during what we call Reconstruction, the years immediately after the war, Congress required the states of the former Confederacy to write new state constitutions. Congress also required that black people be allowed to vote in the election for members of that convention and also be allowed to serve. 1867, October the 22nd, to be precise, black men voted for the first time in Virginia and had their votes counted. 24 black men were elected to represent their neighborhoods in that constitutional convention. That convention produced the most radical change in Virginia ever. It guaranteed suffrage for African Americans two years before the 15th Amendment. This worked a complete revolution in politics. Most instances of expansion and inclusion are followed by instances of backlash, and, and especially with suffrage expansion. Every time we've come up against these instances of um, inclusion, we generally have instances where people are trying to resist that inclusion. The readjusters and Republicans had treated black voters with respect, and black voters had influence, and many white voters thought that was appalling. So they turned back the clock. When the white supremacists reorganized the Democratic Party early in the 1880s to defeat the biracial readjuster Republican coalition, they showed that during the course of the 19th century, government in Virginia had made a transition from being a government of the tobacco planter, by the tobacco planters, for the tobacco planters, into a government of the businessmen, by the businessmen, and for the businessmen, so long as they were all white. So they, they created an enormously uh, influential political machine. They gained control of the legislature and rewrote all the election laws, giving themselves absolute control over voter registration and the conduct of elections. The way you get a machine like that in place and keep it in place is you don't let very many people vote. They cheated a great deal. This, was, this late 19th century was a really wretched time in Virginia politics. That's why they wanted a constitutional convention in 1902, so that they wouldn't have to cheat in order to win. So they did the biggest cheat of all. They stole democracy. The devil was in the details when it came to stealing democracy. As the 20th century dawned, 
regressive forces in Virginia worked to undo Reconstruction era laws and direct new roadblocks to suffrage. 1902, there was a new constitution put into effect in Virginia. Its principal purpose was to deny the vote to black men. That is so detailed a provision that the disfranchisement clauses of the Constitution of 1902 are actually longer than the entire Constitution of 1776, which was the Virginia's first Constitution. Just look at the laws that they wrote about controlling voting. They put in a poll tax. You had to pay a tax in order to register to vote. It was the only tax the state did not try to collect. You had to go pay it voluntarily. The law said you had to pay it months and months and months in advance of registration. Most African Americans and poor whites wouldn't have even gone to the courthouse to register because they couldn't afford the dollar and fifty cent poll tax. So um, disenfranchisement really works um, free of violence for the most part in the Commonwealth for most of the 20th century. Um, and in that way, the Commonwealth of Virginia is distinct from many other areas in the South. Poll taxes pretty much do the trick. After 1902, you not only had to pay your poll tax in advance, you had to have been paid up for three years preceding. That was in fact a very heavy financial burden on poor people. And most black people were poor. Most white people were poor. So it made it almost impossible for people to be able to vote. They disfranchised almost all of the black voters in the state and about half of the white voters. The entire number of voters in Virginia dropped by half between the presidential elections of 1900 and 1904. That was on purpose. Virginia in the early part of the 20th century had the lowest rate of voter participation of any state in the country and almost any place in the entire world. It was really scandalous. While many men, both white and black, were newly disenfranchised by these measures, Virginia's women, regardless of the color of their skin, remained where they had always been, on the periphery, locked out of the electorate. The powers that be in Virginia were opposed to woman suffrage and they never ratified a state constitutional amendment to allow women to vote and they failed to ratify the federal constitutional amendment that eventually forced woman suffrage on Virginia in 1920. That political machine lasted from the mid-1880s to the mid-1960s, 80 years, about 20% of the whole of Virginia's history. Half of that time, it was under the management of Harry Flood Bird of Winchester. He inherited this machine. He didn't create it. Some people think he made it. He actually inherited it. That machine had uh, polished its techniques to a high gloss, and he was a superb manager of people. Harry Bird was a businessman. He was devoted to government by business for the purposes of business. He didn't really care about anybody else's welfare except businessmen like himself. Despite the efforts of the Bird machine and others, African Americans did not accept disenfranchisement as a permanent condition. The nature in which whites orchestrate Southern racism has a lot to do with the strategies that African Americans devise to fight against Jim Crow. You wouldn't have been able to get away with what Virgin black Virginians did in Mississippi, for instance, in large part because they were threatened with violence. But in absence of violence, African Americans, once they pay the levies, actually find it relatively easy, um, and I say relatively, to become part of the political process. So you had actually seen African Americans participating some, a very small amount, in the political process before World War II. The Second World War saw America mobilize on a massive scale to fight and defeat totalitarianism around the globe. It also led many to re-examine their own nation's democratic ideals and reinvigorate their efforts to establish African Americans as full and equal participants in the political process. African Americans returned from fighting fascism abroad, back home, with a sense of urgency, right, to participate in democracy. This is commonly known as the Double V campaign. One could argue that it's impossible to separate what becomes the Voting Rights Act from black political will in the late 1950s and the 1960s. In fact, Nicholas Katzenbach, who writes the Voting Rights Act, learns from African Americans who are meeting resistance in certain areas throughout the South and that's how they figure out the nuts and bolts of the voting which whites becomes one of the strongest civil rights bills of the 20th century in large part. President Johnson addresses a joint session of Congress to push a voting rights bill aimed at ending discrimination. 
It would appoint federal voting registrars in some instances and put an end to complicated literacy tests and other hampering tactics. Changes brought by the Voting Rights Act and other measures inspired by the Civil Rights Movement reverberated throughout Virginia. In 1968, the General Assembly recognized the need to revise the 1902 Constitution and undo the discriminatory laws that had hampered the lives of so many Virginians for decades. Virginia sees a kind of political revolution after Harry Byrd's machine dies and, and Byrd himself dies, and um, you begin to see the rise of uh, Republicans and non-Byrd Democrats. And um, they have a proverbial come to Jesus moment. They realize, in large part because of the freedom struggle, that it's time to rewrite the Virginia Constitution. It actually caught Virginia up with some new legal developments, many of them coming out of the Civil Rights Movement. No more poll tax to vote. Uh, everyone had an equal right to vote. Everyone had an equal right to go to a good public school. So we do get um, that Constitution conforming Virginia to the national norm in a way that had not been the case before. The revised Constitution set Virginia on a new course, but it couldn't erase the state's past. The Voting Rights Act required the federal government to keep an eye on Virginia and other states with similar histories a requirement that remained in place for nearly 50 years. What the Voting Rights Act did is it triggered certain areas. And the trigger means if a certain amount of people weren't registered to vote, I think it's on November 1st of 1964, then those areas were triggered by the Voting Rights Act, it means that they were covered by the VRA. And if you were covered by the VRA, you could make no voting related changes without, a without explicitly appealing to the federal government in Washington, D.C., the federal court in Washington, D.C., for approval. In Virginia, in any locality, if you wanted to make a change with your voting or election process, you had to go before Department of Justice and explain why you were changing a polling place, why you were buying new voting equipment, things like that had to be pre-cleared, is what they called it, with the Justice Department. They had certain people they would call and say, what effect is this gonna have on you and your population? Section five covers Virginia after 1965 until 2014. Um, Section five is still on the books, but because the Supreme Court um, litigated against section four, which was the triggering mechanism. So section five is in indirectly been rendered obsolete. While the federal government has worked to clarify who can vote, it has long been the responsibility of local governments to determine how people vote. The means for casting a ballot have advanced with gains in technology. They have also provided greater accessibility for some previously overlooked voters. The federal government does not run elections. Uh, elections are local. We had the Help America Vote Act back in the 2000s to give one-time federal in induction of, of funds. But since then and before then, since 1776, the federal government has stayed out of all local elections. And that was because of the hanging chads of 2000. Elections are always evolving. We started off with punch card and lever machines. And after the 2000 election, there was an effort to move out um, older voting methods and bring in some new voting systems to localities. There was also some federal money. And in line with that accessibility um, for voters, there was the electronic voting equipment that had onboard systems for audio ballots. And that was what a lot of localities went with, Henrico included. We wanted visually impaired voters to be able to cast an independent ballot. And the best way to do that is through an audio ballot and electronic ballots. Vulnerabilities happen with the technology being aged out. And we used that system until 2015. And that was moving in an effort to a response for voters that wanted to have a backup if there was indeed a recount. And with electronic equipment, there was no ability to go back and look at anything. And with a paper ballot system that we're using now, 
if there's a recount, those ballots are pulled out and they're rescanned and if necessary could be hand counted. Election Day brings together friends, neighbors, and voters from all walks of life at Henrico's 91 precincts. Similar scenes play out in localities across the Commonwealth. Well, in Virginia, Election Day uh, is really uh, 133 different elections going on simultaneously. So it is really a, you know, a, a undertaking involving thousands of people across the state. It's a long day. And we know that it's going to be a long day, but we try to make it a, um, a pleasant experience both for the workers and for the voters coming in. Much of the change that has been moving in this direction is having all of the voters on the same page, whether they're in Henrico or somewhere else in another state, that there is a certain expectation of what should be experienced in a polling place. You're going to be asked your name, you're going to be asked your address. If you're on the book, you'll be given a ballot, you'll be given an I voted sticker, and you leave. Voting is a fundamental right, and so it shouldn't be hard for people to exercise that right. Uh, and they should be comfortable when they're doing it, and they should uh, be confident that their vote's being counted uh, as they cast it, and that the results of the election really reflect the will of the voters. One thing that I think all of us like about the process is that even though we're there to make sure that everyone has their chance to vote, when we're inside the precinct, we don't have to worry about any of the people that are passing out ballots outside or any of the TV ads that are going on or anything that's taken place before. We are just there to, to do our thing and it's quiet as far as the candidates go. Everyone just votes. They love to come down and get their I Voted sticker. Uh, there are restaurants that give discounts if you have an I Voted sticker. And, and people like to wear it with pride. We always offer a sticker and sometimes we give them to the children that have come in with their parents to vote. But for some reason it's a little thing. It's like kids in school. Everybody wants a sticker. They would like uh, the absentee voting stickers. They would like I Registered stickers. So anything that they could show their pride of what they've done in the process. The unfettered right to vote is available to more Virginians today than at any point in the state's history. That right is not always exercised, however. Participation in presidential elections often reaches 75% or greater, but turnout for local elections can dip into the single digits. There's probably no better way to honor people who fought for the franchise, people who fought for the right to vote than to go out and vote, right? And, it un and as, as simplistic as that sounds, if you look at the data on the number of Americans who do not participate in the political process, it's nothing short of appalling, given the long history of contention that arose from people trying to be involved in the decision-making process. Do we want 100% turnout? Sure, it would be great. The lines would be long, but we would love it. Uh, but people choose not to vote. Uh, that's their way of casting a ballot, is staying home. It's their decision, and that's what we want. We want the voters' rights to be their decision to vote and cast that ballot. We are always learning uh, how to make the process better, uh, how to improve that process, how to make it easier for folks to participate. And we do our best as election officials uh, to make, that a, make it a good experience for them to go vote so that they want to participate. I look at it as a privilege and an honor because I have that right and ability to do it. I look forward to all the elections and casting my vote. And I feel like it's a disservice if I don't allow myself to participate in the process. So I, I take it very seriously.